Well, good evening, everyone. I am Brooke Clement. I am the director here at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, and I am so happy to be welcoming you tonight for our first public programs that we've had here at the library since the pandemic. So we're very excited. Thank you all for coming. So I'm just going to get us started by um, letting you know that there's some other additional upcoming programming here at the library that we hope that you'll come out for as well. Um, on February 28th, the archival staff here will be presenting a lunch and learn um, that will be utilizing some of our primary, primary source resources um, and making them accessible. You'll, you'll be able to get up close and personal with some of our primary source records. And then on April 9th, we are going to have Barbara McQuaid here, and she is going to be discussing her latest book called Attack from Within, How Disinformation is Sabotaging America. So and I just want to thank our, our foundation for their continued support, and thank you also for your support of our library and museum. And now I'm going to turn it over to Joel Westfall, our deputy director here, and he is going to be introducing our guests for the evening. Good evening. Good evening. So I have been working with lecturers and authors for quite some time now. And one should probably not say um, that one has a favorite, uh, but I do, and, and he's here tonight. Uh, Garrett Graff is a true friend uh, to the National Archives. How true a friend is Garrett Graff. When Garrett, and he has said this himself, when Garrett writes out his checks to the IRS, Garrett fully and loves to believe that every single cent goes directly to the National Archives <laughs> for, our, for our use. Uh, Garrett, I'm not so sure that's true. Um, I'm pretty sure that it goes for something like an F-35 tail hook or something like that, but it's really, it's the thought that counts, Garrett. It's, it's, it's the thought that counts. Um, Garrett's uh, literary career is extremely impressive. Uh, the Washingtonian editor, the Politico editor. Uh, he wrote his first major book on the FBI uh, and Robert Mueller and got himself a fairly sweet gig at CNN and a, and a ton of national exposure uh, during that time. He followed that up with a Cold War book, my personal favorite, uh, Raven Rock, the story of how the U.S. government planned to save itself while the rest of us die. <laughs> And then followed that, that up with what I consider to be uh, an oral history masterpiece, uh, the only uh, plane in the sky, an oral history of 9-11. To follow that up, he would write a Pulitzer Prize finalist book, uh, Watergate, which he is going to talk to you all about tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, the National Archives friend, my friend, Garrett Graff. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. It's uh, a little bit of, it feels a little bit of pressure to be the first event back after four years. Um, Joel made the point, if tonight does not go well, maybe there won't be more future <laughs> events after this. Um, and, uh, but it, it's my pleasure to be back here in Ann Arbor uh, and to be speaking at the, uh, the Presidential Library here. Uh, as Joel uh, stole my joke already, um, uh, every one of the books that I've done, I've had the opportunity to do research uh, uh, at or, or, uh, or with the help of uh, teams at the, the Presidential Libraries and the National Archives, and I really consider it an incredible national treasure. So tonight I want to talk about Watergate. Um, and if you are like any of the people that I spoke to in the course of writing this book, you are probably sitting there thinking, what more is there to say about Watergate? 
And that was very much what I thought coming into this book. This was a book that actually grew out of the work that I was doing uh, during the Trump administration covering the impeachments and the investigations into the 2016 election and, uh, and Donald Trump's uh, campaign, which got me interested in this question of what was it like for our country the last time we were investigating a president. Now, as an author, one of the things that I've learned is that every time you write a book, there is something about the book that surprises you. And for me, what surprised me about Watergate was I thought that I knew the Watergate story when I sat down to write a book about Watergate. And what I quickly determined was that the Watergate that we thought that we collectively as a nation lived through from 1972 to 1974 is not the Watergate as we have now come to understand it through history. And so this book really tries to untangle much of the mythology around that event and the players and the people, a couple of the aspects of which I want to talk about tonight. I'm a child of the 1980s, I was a budding journalist, so I grew up with the mythology of Woodward and Bernstein and all the president's men and Hal Holbrook in the parking garage telling them, follow the money. And one of the first things that I realized in the course of the researching the book was that Deep Throat never told Woodward and Bernstein to follow the money. And in fact, no one during the entire Watergate story was ever advised to follow the money. It was entirely a flourish of the screenwriter of the, uh, of the, uh, of the movie that added that line, which has now become the sort of iconic piece of journalism advice anyone ever gets in covering a scandal. And so that, for me, was the first window into trying to untangle the difference between what the story was as we understood it then and what we understand it now to be. And what I came to understand is that Watergate was not just an event, that we tend to tell the Watergate story today as there was the burglary on June 17, 1972, you have Woodward, Bernstein, John Dean, the tapes, Saturday Night Massacre, yada, 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 Nixon resigns. And that actually Watergate is much better understood not as an event, but as a mindset. And that Watergate was really an umbrella for about a dozen distinct but interrelated scandals with overlapping but often separate sets of players. That, trans, uh, that unfolded across the Nixon presidency from the campaign of 1968 straight through his resignation in the summer of 1974, 50 years ago, of course, this summer, a 50-year anniversary that is, of course, quite significant to the Gerald Ford Presidential Library and Museum. And we've begun to understand, as part of that, some of the central mysteries of Watergate, which has always been the most basic, why didn't Richard Nixon hang the burglars out to dry on the morning of June 18th, 1972, where he could have very honestly said, I know nothing about this burglary, I had nothing to do with its planning, and I disavow these rogue, corrupt aides, and I look forward to rolling on to my landslide victory in November as the most, uh, as the largest presidential landslide in American history. And the answer turns out to be something that we've only figured out in about the last 10 years which is that by the time the burglary had happened on June 17, 1972, 
Richard Nixon did not know anything about the burglars going in that night. He did not know anything about the plans to bug the DNC. But by that point, he was so buried in so many crimes and so many conspiracies that he wasn't sure who knew what about what and couldn't hang them out to dry. But the, the real story of Watergate begins not in 1972, not in 1971, but actually all the way back in 1968. That in the fall of 1968, this is of course Nixon running for the presidency as the former vice president running against the sitting vice president of the United States, Hubert Humphrey. We begin to see what turns out to be the original sin of Watergate. Where in that fall of 1968, the dominant issue of course is the Vietnam War. And you have that fall Lyndon Johnson, broken from his years of leading the country during Vietnam, convening the Paris peace talks. And Nixon understands that peace in Vietnam would actually be pretty bad for him politically in the midst of the campaign. And so he, working with his campaign manager, John Mitchell, and a Washington socialite named, named Anna Chenault team up to stall the Paris peace talks. Nixon acting as a private citizen at that point uh, through John Mitchell, through Anna Chenault, goes to the South Vietnamese government and says, if you stall these peace talks, I will give you a better deal for peace when I become president. He teams up with uh, the help also of a young rising star foreign policy aide named Henry Kissinger, who is back channeling him information to, from the Paris peace talks uh, in, uh, in, in Paris, even though Kissinger is actually there representing the other side. Uh, he's feeding the information to uh, to Nixon on the campaign trail. And it works. And the Paris peace talks stall in the fall of 68. And in the 72 hours before the November election, Lyndon Johnson figures out this treachery. The NSA is bugging the South Vietnamese embassy, and he uh, gets these signals, intelligence intercepts showing this plot and confronts Richard Nixon. Nixon says, I deny the whole thing. This is false. I've got nothing to do with this. By the time sort of the whole thing plays out, the election has happened and Nixon wins. And Lyndon Johnson, for the good of the country, decides to bury the whole thing. He decides it's going to be too complicated to say that we're spying on our allies, the South Vietnamese, and it's going to be too complicated for me to charge the now president-elect with this treachery. It, but to put a very fine point on this, in the fall of 1968, as a private citizen, Richard Nixon stalls the Paris peace talks and keeps the Vietnam War going for his own political benefit. It is as close to a credible allegation of treason as we have against any major political American figure in the 20th century. Johnson buries the whole thing. He seals it up in where? His presidential library, of course. And it is declassified and released only about 10 years ago. But Nixon knows that Johnson knows. And this becomes the Edgar Allan Poe telltale heart <laughs> beating away in Nixon's presidency, where he lives every day in fear that this treachery is going to come out. And so fast forward to 1971 and the release of the Pentagon Papers. And the Pentagon Papers should be 
the greatest triumph of Richard Nixon's political career. There are two million words in the Pentagon Papers, and not a single one of them is the word Nixon. <laughs> they are entirely about the Kennedys and Lyndon Johnson, his two greatest sworn political enemies. And that these documents, the lies of the Kennedy years, the lies of the Johnson years, should be this incredible moment of triumph for Richard Nixon in sinking his two greatest political enemies. But Nixon is concerned that if the Pentagon Papers are coming out, the Chenault Affair Papers are going to come out too. And because he becomes obsessed with, and we have no reason actually now to believe that this is true at all, but he comes to believe that there is a copy of the papers about this Anna Chenault, South Vietnamese, Paris Peace Talks affair in the safe at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C which is you know, the, think tank, the sort of uh, liberal-leaning think tank on Massachusetts Avenue. And so in the summer of 1971, a year before we now know the Watergate burglary takes place, Nixon is on the White House tapes ordering the only burglary that we think Richard Nixon ever actually ordered, which is not the burglary of the Watergate, it's the burglary of the Brookings Institution. And this plot comes together in the summer of 1971 in the wake of the Pentagon Papers. They bring two guys named E. Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy into the White House to begin to figure out how to burglarize the Brookings Institution. G. Gordon Liddy knows a couple of Cubans with E. Howard Hunt in Miami that he thinks will be great burglars. And they come up with this plot. They're going to firebomb the Brookings Institution. They're going to bring the Cubans up, dress them as DC firefighters, equip them with a surplus fire truck uh, marked up as if it is a DC fire truck that they are going to purchase and outfit. And then in the wake of the firebombing, this fake fire truck with fake Cuban firefighters on it will respond to the scene. And amid the chaos and the confusion of fighting the fire, the Cubans will get into Brookings, go to the top floor where this safe is, break into this safe, and steal back this, what we now believe is never uh, existing Chenault file. The plan falls apart late summer 71, not because someone in the White House realizes that this is one of the most insane and harebrained <laughs> and illegal schemes anyone close to the presidency has ever come up with, but because, as G. Gordon Liddy reports, the Nixon campaign decides it's too cheap to buy the fire truck. But they have now created this unit inside the White House that comes to be known as the Plumbers. And the Plumbers, over the course of that fall and that winter, begin to work up these other schemes, which we now come to recognize sort of lead us eventually to Watergate. And so we now understand that sort of the Watergate scheme, the Watergate scandal, is sort of too far along by June, 19, June 17, 1972, that Nixon can't come clean about this burglary that he doesn't know about, because these burglars are actually the ones who came in to do this other burglary about this much worse scandal about this treachery in the 1968 campaign, and that if you sort of start pulling on this thread in 1972, it's gonna lead all the way back to the Chenault affair, 
in the fall of 1968. And that basically there are just too many crimes and conspiracies and schemes by then for Nixon to stop it. There's also sort of a second major thread of this story that we now understand in new ways that we did not understand when we were living through this, which is the identity of Deep Throat. We were raised with this idea of Hal Holbrook and the guy, shadowy guy in the parking garage probably some Nixon insider disgusted with the corruption he sees in the Oval Office out there fighting for truth, justice, and apple pie with Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein to bring truth and save democracy in the White House. It actually turns out that Deep Throat had none of those motives. It turns out we've actually all sort of known a Deep Throat in our life. Deep Throat, we now realize as of 2005, is a guy named Mark Felt, who was the deputy director of the FBI. Mark Felt, in 1972, is the heir apparent to J. Edgar Hoover. He has outlasted everyone else in the 50-year war of succession to take over the Bureau whenever J. Edgar Hoover leaves or dies. In May 2nd, 1972, six weeks before the Watergate burglary, J. Edgar Hoover dies in his sleep. Mark Felt has a couple of hours where he thinks he's going to be the next director of the FBI, and then Richard Nixon does the unthinkable. He appoints an outsider, L. Patrick Gray III, to be the interim FBI director. And Mark Felt decides he is going to dedicate his career to sinking Pat Gray. We all know this guy from working in an office. He's the guy who didn't get the promotion that he thought he was supposed to get, who then decides he's going to spend his career undermining the guy who did get the job. We've all worked with that person, right? <laughs> and six weeks later, the burglary happens, and Mark Felt starts leaking to the press the details of how Pat Gray is screwing up the Watergate investigation. He starts off leaking to Sandy Smith from Time Magazine, one of the best sourced law enforcement reporters in Washington. Then he sort of widens his leaking operation to include the Washington Post's crosstown rival, the Washington Daily News, and is leaking details to them in July of 1972. Then amid the newspaper wars of the 1970s, in mid-July 1972, the Washington Daily News goes out of business. And he turns to his third choice, this young reporter named Bob Woodward at the Washington Post. And through the fall of 1972, we see these incredible moments where Mark felt knows the terrible details of what Richard Nixon is up to in the White House, doesn't bother to tell anyone, because the only thing he cares about is sinking Pat Gray. <laughs> so the only details he's actually giving to Bob Woodward are the ones that lead one to question the uh, efficacy and integrity of the FBI's own investigation. And we now sort of understand, again, better that Woodward and Bernstein matter in that summer and fall of reporting, but really they are part of a constellation of about a half dozen correspondents, including Walter Ruggeber and Seymour Hirsch from the New York Times, Jack, uh, Jack Nelson and Ron Ostro from the LA Times, who all help keep the story alive through that summer and fall 
and end up uh, sort of leading the story uh, to stay alive through March of 1973 when the trial of the original burglars begins to kick off the momentum of the story of its own. And that what we see, uh, all of these sort of pieces of this story now come together in ways that we didn't really understand then, but collectively paint this portrait of a, this dark criminal conspiratorial mindset that Richard Nixon brings to his presidency that permeates his presidency throughout his administration and lead to all of these different uh, distinct scandals unfolding under the umbrella of what we now call Watergate. And that what we now understand is that in many ways the groundwork for Watergate was going to sink Nixon at some point in this administration even if the burglars weren't caught that night of June 17th, 1972. That sort of the momentum uh, and overhang of all of these conspiracies and crimes was going to catch up with Nixon at some point. And the shame of it, of course, is that by almost any stretch or definition, Nixon stands as one of the most consequential presidents of the entire 20th century. Between 1952 and 1972, he's on the national presidential ticket five times, a record in US history equaled only by FDR himself. In an era when most Americans got their news through newspapers and magazines, Richard Nixon was on the cover of Time magazine more than any other human. Nixon appeared on the cover of Time Magazine a total of 55 times, more than a year's worth of Time Magazines over the course of his career. This is a president who, you know, was the first to travel to a communist bloc country, the first to travel to Moscow, the first to travel to Beijing as part of his historic reopening of China. This is a president who signed Title IX, who created OSHA, who created the EPA, wound down the Vietnam War after he kept it going for six and additional years, <laughs> and brought detente with the Soviet Union. He brought more than 1,000 women into the middle management of the federal government, brought the first female military aides to the White House, had the first presidential aide in the White House actually dedicated to increasing the role and presence of women in the federal government. This is sort of somewhat, this is, he fought inflation, he brought the uh, U.S. off the gold standard, he, uh, uh, he ended the draft, turning the military into an all-volunteer force. And yet, sort of all of these accomplishments today are sh overshadowed by sort of the single word of Watergate. We are still today, of course, left with some intriguing mysteries, still 50 years later. We still don't know why the burglars were going into the Watergate that night in the first place. The Watergate operation uh, that we think of was actually the second Watergate burglary. They had uh, broken into the Watergate a couple of weeks earlier to plant bugs, uh, and those bugs were not operating sufficient, uh, were not operating correctly. So the, this was the second burglary meant in some ways to fix the mistakes of the first one. This was all part of the dirty tricks operation that G. Gordon Liddy had put together known as Operation Gemstone. This was the dirty tricks that he had uh, planned, that he had put together to go through the entire campaign. Began in January of that year with a presentation uh, that he made to 
John Dean, Jeb Stuart Magruder, and John Mitchell. John Mitchell, of course, the Nixon's campaign manager from the 68 campaign was going to reprise that role in the 72 campaign, but during that first term of the administration had been the Attorney General of the United States. So G. Gordon Liddy brings in to John Mitchell's office uh, uh, at the Justice Department uh, these large poster boards outlining his illegal dirty tricks campaign. He's not an idiot. He knows you can't go to your local Kinko's to uh, have them print up the posters for your illegal dirty tricks operation meant to help the president undermine the Democratic Party. So he has the CIA print up the posters <laughs> that he takes into John Mitchell's office. And he begins to walk through one poster board at a time this incredibly complex and uh, extensive series of dirty tricks. Each one has a sub code name. There's Operation Opal, Operation Sapphire, Operation Ruby, all of them gemstones under the umbrella of Operation Gemstone. It's a wild set of plans. It includes a specially outfitted spy plane that would follow around the Democratic nominee as the Democratic nominee traversed the country with eavesdropping, inf uh, eavesdropping equipment and a sort of dirty tricks that they could deploy against the campaign in real time across the country. It includes an operation to uh, protect the Republican convention that would involve uh, G. Gordon Liddy and his operatives kidnapping key anti-war protesters, drugging them and taking them to Mexico for the duration of the Republican convention to ensure that they were not able to uh, disrupt the Republican convention. And then a series of high-priced call girls that they intended to recruit for the Democratic Convention in Miami, where they would specially uh, outfit a houseboat with audio and video surveillance and l use these call girls to lure back senior Democratic Party officials for, uh, who would then confess campaign secrets in flagrante uh, on the, uh, for this audio and video surveillance on the houseboat during the Democratic Convention. And then there's like a bunch of other run-of-the-mill stuff of planting spies in the foreign, uh, in the opponent's campaigns and disrupting rallies and disrupting get-out-the-vote operations, you know, sort of all of the normal stuff as well. <laughs> so he finishes this presentation and he John Mitchell takes the pipe out of his mouth, sitting Attorney General of the United States, and he does not say, gee, Gordon Liddy, this is one of the most illegal things I've ever heard in my entire life. I'm going to have the FBI agent sitting in the ante room of my office arrest you on the way out of the office. He says, Gordon, this is a little bit more expensive than I was planning to spend. Could you come back in a couple of weeks with a cheaper plan? And so Gordon comes back about two weeks later with a plan that's half as expensive. Gordon, uh, John Mitchell and John Dean then sort of say at that point, um, you know, still this is a little bit more expensive than we would want, you know, we'll kick the can down the road. And over the course of the spring, the plan just sort of keeps getting a little bit cheaper, a little bit smaller sort of here and there. And eventually it gets approved. There's a little bit of a, a question of who actually approved the plan uh, in the end. Uh, everyone involved denies being the person who approves the plan. But G. Gordon Liddy moves ahead with a cheaper scaled back version of this which is how we end up with the Watergate burglary in the first place, which is that that night, 
they have gone into the Watergate, you know, the two weeks earlier to conduct the first bugging operation. It doesn't work. But Gordon Liddy has brought the Cuban burglars up from Miami not to break into the Watergate that weekend, but to break into McG McGovern's headquarters and bug McGovern's headquarters on Saturday night. And because he's under all of this cost uh, pressure, financial pressure for his operation, he decides as long as they're in town, I should have them break into the Watergate on Friday night to fix the last burglary, and then on Saturday night we'll hit McGovern's operation. And of course, they're caught that Friday night and never make it to McGovern's operation. But what they were doing there, we don't really still know. Because while some part of it was a bugging operation, that they were trying to get in and fix these bugs, there are now multiple competing theories and testimonies about whether the operation was also meant to dig up dirt on the Democrats that were hidden in the files of the DNC, or to uncover what dirt the Democrats had on Richard Nixon. Because the other thing that Richard Nixon is concerned about that summer is not the treachery with the South Vietnamese government, but the other illegal foreign government deal that he made in the campaign of 68, when he took a large cash contribution amid uh, money pressure in the 68 campaign from the Greek military junta which Lawrence O'Brien and the Democratic uh, Party leaders had figured out, and he was afraid was going to come out at some point in that fall campaign in 72. So there were sort of multiple reasons that these burglars appear to be going in, and what we now sort of believe is that it's possible that there were as many as two or three different plots among the burglars, among the five burglars uh, who, and uh, Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy that night, that not all of the burglars were in on, <laughs> and that there were sort of competing loyalties and plans and plots even just within that burglary team that night. And that, again, sort of helps us understand better why that next day Richard Nixon couldn't just hang these burglars out to dry because who knows who knew what about why the burglars were going in that night and what various other plots or schemes they might have been trying to either uncover or cover up depending on whose plot and who, which burglar you were talking to. So I'm going to stop there and it'll open it up to questions, but I hope uh, at the very least you have a better understanding for why uh, so much of what we think we knew about Watergate turns out not to be true now, 50 years later. So. <laughs> All right. The first question down here. Oh. All, all the way at the back of the aisle there, if you... You guys can just, if you want to just queue up there, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much. Um, the question is, uh, what is Gerald's outdoor Yeah, I, um, I don't know that the microphone's on, but I, I heard the question and, and can... Uh, um, uh, repeat it, which is, you know, what did Gerald Ford think of all of this? Um, and what we, uh, you know, the question, uh, Gerald Ford thought different things at many different times over the course of this. Um, one of the things, again, that we've sort of now come to understand uh, is uh, Ford realized earlier than many that Nixon was going to end up resigning over this. 
um, and that there, um, there's a reporter named Tom DeFrank uh, who uh, had a conversation with Ford um, as early as really that spring of 74, uh, where Ford says, you know, basically like, I just need to wait this out and um, it'll become, you know, I'll, I'll be president by this, uh, by the end of this, but I can't actually, you know, say that publicly and, and can't uh, bring this out. Uh, it, you know, I can't be the one who sort of forces this process along. Um, you know, Ford's role in all of this ends up being such a fascinating uh, sort of side thread of this story because, of course, how Ford ends up in this uh, is because of Spiro Agnew. And that, you know, you, 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 one of the wildest parts of the Watergate story is how you have all of these other moments that in any other presidential administration would be among the most scandalous and dramatic of any presidential administration in modern American history that are really sort of rounding errors on the Watergate story. <laughs> and Spiro Agnew, the sitting vice president of the United States, forced from office by a totally unrelated criminal bribery scheme, um, is, uh, is one of those. You know, in any other scenario, this would be one of the craziest stories to have ever taken place in, in the modern White House. Uh, the FBI begins investigating Agnew. Uh, it turns out to be a relatively straightforward investigation because Spiro Agnew was actually taking cash bribes in the vice president's office in the White House and the Secret Service takes really good notes of who walks in and out of the vice president's office. And so they had very detailed schedules of when Spiro Agnew received the bribes in the White House. And in early October uh, 1972, sorry, 73, uh, Agnew is forced to resign, kicking off what is uh, you know, probably the wildest month in uh, the history of the American presidency. You know, for, for all of the drama of the last couple of years and overlapping scandals and news cycles that we lived through, we've probably never lived through something like October 73, which begins with Agnew's resignation, then the kickoff of the Yom Kippur War, the battle uh, of the Nixon tapes leading to the Saturday Night Massacre, the firing of uh, Special Counsel Archibald Cox, and the resignation of the Attorney General Elliot uh, Richardson and his Deputy Attorney General. Uh, Nixon, in the wake of that, when he's, you know, choosing Gerald Ford as uh, his new Vice President, He's sort of drinking heavily through that whole month. And so in the final week of uh, October, when uh, the Yom Kippur War heats up again and there's a fear that the Soviet Union is going to enter the war, uh, his aides, his chief of staff, Al Haig, and uh, Henry Kissinger, who's both the national security advisor and the secretary of state in that moment, uh, decide it, late in October that they are going to put the nation on DEFCON 3, the only time in the entire Cold War that the nation goes to DEFCON 3 without ever mentioning it to the president because Nixon is so drunk up in the White House residence that he can't come down to participate in the meetings in the Situation Room. And so they take the nation to DEFCON 3 amid the Yom Kippur War and then tell Nixon the next morning when he wakes up and comes down to, uh, to the Oval Office. And again, like sort of all of this is just playing out against the backdrop of the Watergate story in a way that we, um, you know, are now sort of forget like just how dramatic and just how tense 
so many of these days actually were. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I have two quick questions, uh, or one quick and one not so quick. So one is about um, Ellsberg's arrest and the break-in at um, Ellsberg's um, psychiatrist's office in Los Angeles and kind of how that's fitting into the chain of events that you provided. And the other is kind of about the general sort of um, feeling of paranoia. And is it sort of coming from Richard Nixon's character or is there somebody else um, that is uh, kind of enabling this or setting this sort of um, spycraft tone and sort of like what's uh, seeding this? Yeah, um, it's a great question and it's all Richard Nixon. Um, and what you see is, you know, this dark, paranoid, criminal, conspiratorial mindset that Nixon brings to the White House that permeates all of the top aides around him and, and enable them to, you know, in sort of tacitly or explicitly carry out so many of these other schemes and conspiracies. You know, part of the challenge with Richard Nixon, of course, is He's dogged throughout his political career by allegations of, you know, uniquely uh, nasty campaigning and uh, dirty tricks in his earlier campaigns. Um, you know, his uh, camp, you know, his Senate uh, campaign against Helen Gahagan Douglas. Um, you know, his sort of virulent anti-communism. Uh, he, it, it, you know, he in many ways is one of the instigators of what we now consider, uh, you know, McCarthyism. Like, you know, and I'm actually a sort of firm believer that basically, like, it's mostly J. Edgar Hoover and Richard Nixon who launch us into McCarthyism, uh, and that m sort of McCarthy is actually one of the least interesting players in the Red Scare there. Um, you know, Nixon goes in six years from a congressman to vice president of the United States, uh, basically by being the nastiest anti-communist fighter in American politics, uh, and is chosen for Dwight Eisenhower's ticket when Dwight Eisenhower basically feels like he needs someone who is more hawkish on communism. I mean, it, it says something about that moment that, you know, Dwight Eisenhower, five-star general who leads D-Day and the defeat of the Germans in Europe, is seen as sort of insufficiently hawkish in 52 that he feels like he needs to sort of shore up his uh, flank with, by choosing Richard Nixon. But at the same time, part of the challenge of you know, Nixon is that saying, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Um, and in 1960, remember, he has lost the presidency uh, to John F. Kennedy with what are probably pretty credible allegations that the Democratic machine in Illinois, you know, effectively stole the presidency from him. He does not contest that. Um, he uh, accepts the loss and you know, accepts Kennedy as the legitimate winner of the election. But coming into the 68 campaign, you know, feels like he needs to do every dirty trick that he can in order to defeat the dirty tricks that he thinks are being played against him. Um, and you know, the irony of Richard Nixon's career is that sort of probably the one election in his entire career he didn't need any dirty tricks for is the 72 campaign. Um, and that this, uh, but by then it, it's such his standard operating procedure uh, that he feels like he needs to pull out all the stops uh, in order to, you know, pull out a victory in, in 72 and sort of starts all of this in motion before he realizes that, you know, he's on his way to the greatest presidential landslide in American history. Yeah. Okay, anything on Ellsberg? Oh, yes, sorry, the Ellsberg question. Um, 
So the Ellsberg question um, becomes really the first plot that the plumbers are activated to do, which is to de decredit uh, or discredit um, Daniel Ellsberg uh, through a variety of means, one of which is to try to break in to uh, his psychiatrist's office in California over Labor Day weekend in 71. Uh, and uh, to, what is the most interesting aspect of that, uh, again, when you dig into the history of this, is to me uh, the role that the CIA ends up playing in the background of that operation, which is the CIA uh, is who Gordon Liddy and Howard Hunt turn to for all of their spy equipment, their disguises, uh, and most notably their surveillance photos. And so uh, they go out and they take these photo surveillance photographs of uh, Fielding's um, files, or uh, Fielding's office. Uh, in California, bring them back uh, and have the CIA develop them. And there are all of these little moments in sort of the backdrop of the Watergate umbrella as it unfolds over the years, where you begin to realize, you know, you have that, you have uh, G. Gordon Liddy making the poster boards for Operation Gemstone with the CIA. The CIA very much knew what Richard Nixon's dirty tricksters were up to. And you get to the burglary team, uh, the Cubans are um, former CIA Bay of Pigs operatives, that Howard Hunt, CIA uh, officer. Uh, is helping to run. He got to know the Cubans through his uh, work uh, helping to plan the Bay of Pigs. James McCord, the campaign security director, who's the bugging man who's caught in the Watergate burglary. Another retired CIA officer, Howard Hunt's actually working for uh, a Mullen PR firm in Washington at that point, which is uh, used as a cover agents, uh, cover employer for CIA operatives overseas. There are a lot of these like weird little moments that make you realize that the CIA was very, not necessarily involved in the execution of any of the Nixon dirty tricks, but was very much involved sort of behind the scenes in supporting the operation and would have had uniquely interesting visibility into what the Nixon campaign was actually doing sort of month by month through that campaign. And sort of what the CIA did with that knowledge, I think is one of the things that uh, to me remains one of the interesting mysteries of Watergate. Great, thank yeah. you. One very quick uh, addition. I would have said that Nixon did order the break-in of Dr. Fielding's office, held Ellsberg psychiatrist, but you implied that was the... Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little more ambiguous. The, the Brookings burglary, he's on tape sort of repeatedly asking, you know, or, ordering the burglary and then actually asking, have you broken into the Brookings Institution yet? Like, why haven't you broken into Brookings yet? Like, when are you going to break? And, um, and there's, there's a, a, a real tape record of that. The fielding, um, his exact knowledge of the fielding operation uh, is a little bit more ambiguous. My, my real question is, I had heard at least one theory about the motive behind the Watergate break-in was that Larry O'Brien might have had files that implicated uh, money coming from Howard Hughes, maybe through Nixon's brother, 
to uh, illegally finance the campaign or just enrich the Nixon family. Yes. Any truth to that? Yeah, so that's one of about five uh, competing theories of what the information was uh, that the burglars might have either been looking for that the Democrats had dirt on Richard Nixon or again, might have been trying to dig up dirt on the Democrats. So, yeah. So the, the name of John Dean doesn't come up as much in your stories as I might have imagined, particularly from John Dean's own accounts. And so I'm wondering about his credibility with respect to certain aspects. So for example, um, the, the story that he tells about the, the Brookings uh, uh, firebombing attempt uh, was that, that he, it, it, it's, I, I suppose Caulfield maybe who tells him, uh, yes. and he goes to Ehrlichman and, uh, and Ehrlichman is not too surprised, but uh, apparently shuts it down. That's one uh, of his accounts. Um, the, uh, the other account is, is of the, the gemstone meeting in, in, the, in Mitchell's office, where again, sort of Dean takes credit for uh, you know, seeing that this is an inappropriate conversation to happen in the office of the Attorney General and, and supposedly shuts that down. Uh, so what, what are we to make of, of John Dean and, and of those accounts? Yeah. Um, so John Dean uh, does appear to shut down the first attempt to firebomb the Brookings Institution, um, and then, uh, which is when Jack Caulfield and, um, uh, plans it in the immediate wake of the leak of the Pentagon Papers, and then G. Gordon Liddy and Howard Hunt sort of restart the plot and actually uh, rethink it and try to execute on it later in the summer. Um, you know, John Dean is a uniquely complex character uh, through the Watergate story. Um, uh, you know, he, he, does, he does the thing that any good defense lawyer will tell a potential defendant to do which is if you are going to flip on a conspiracy, be the first person to flip. And that he, uh, when he decides to go to the prosecutors in the spring of 1973, um, you know, he, uh, he gets there three days before Jeb Stuart Magruder does. Uh, and I think that that timing shapes a lot of our understanding of how Watergate unfolds ever since. Because one of the things that that means is that by the time Jeb Stuart Magruder gets to the prosecutors, they are not interested in hearing about John Dean's role and sort of skip over that. And you could imagine that timing being slightly different and our understanding of whose culpability was what might be a little bit different. Now, what John Dean you know, does and should get credit for is he testified you know, very openly and very truthfully once he stopped orchestrating the cover-up himself <laughs> um, and you know, becomes the starring witness in those June 73 hearings. Um, but, you know, he from the, you know, fall of 72 through the winter of 73 is, you know, very much in the midst of uh, the cover-up himself. Last question, yeah. Hello. Um, what can we learn out of this uh, in the year 2024, where there's some countermeasures, some frames, boundaries changed, or what impact does this, what happened 50 years ago, nowadays? Yeah, um, it's a really good question, and it's one that I think is actually still pretty important for us to learn, which is, to me, Watergate remains an incredibly important story because it is probably the best case study we've ever had of how power operates in Washington and how through the constitutional checks and balances, 
the various institutions of our government can come together to hold leaders accountable. And one of the things that I sort of talk about in talking about Watergate is to me the, you know, All the President's Men is a great movie. But the, the, the problem with All the President's Men is it makes it seem like it's as simple as, you know, Woodward and Bernstein publish some articles and then Nixon resigns. <laughs> and what you see when you get into the Watergate story is that it actually takes an enormous number of heroes to bring Nixon to account. And it requires every institution in the US government playing its own distinct role. Um, and you know, it's not just the media, it's the FBI, the Justice Department, it's the district courts, the appeals courts, the Supreme Court, it's the House, it's the Senate, each of them with their own distinct roles. And it takes, uh, and I, I will be uh, uh, somewhat abstract but uh, pointed in this comment, it takes the Republicans in Congress realizing that they are legislators first and partisans second. That their preeminent role is as a co-equal branch of government holding the executive branch to account rather than being Republicans first. And that what you see throughout the Watergate story is Republicans participating reluctantly, but in good faith, in the congressional proceedings that lead to Nixon's resignation. And it's people like Howard Baker, it's people like Lowell Weicker, um, and uh, you know, ultimately it, you know, leading up to people like Barry Goldwater, who are part of the team that sort of go down to uh, the White House to tell Nixon to resign. And that what all of them understood was that their first and foremost role in the Constitution was as legislators and not as partisans. And that sort of in order for the system to work, every part of that sort of delicate dance of constitutional checks and balances has to have people play their own distinct roles. And that, you know, any one of those people doesn't play that role, Nixon doesn't leave office in the summer of 74. Um, and to me, uh, you know, when, you know, people sort of talk of, you know, Watergate was this, you know, dark and terrible time in the US government. I think it's actually this like, incredible story of the system working and how this like incredible dance of the Constitution and these interlocking checks and balances across Article I, Article II, and Article III can hold leaders accountable and remove corrupt officials from office. So to me, that's the like ultimate modern lesson and the one that I think we've sort of struggled most with in the last couple of years. So thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope you will come back for more uh, as the events keep going. Available to sign books out in the lobby, and we're, we have a table set up if people need to purchase books. So, just thank you all very much for coming out. It's been great to have you all here tonight. <laughs>